When you say America, you say big cars. Whether it's the full-size sedans, the wood-clad station wagons, SUVs or pickup trucks, America likes it big. But when it comes to smaller cars, that's sometimes a rocky relationship. In the past, American car makers developed smaller cars as an immediate and often desperate answer to things like a recession or an oil crisis. But what if I told you American car makers plan to make small cars even earlier than that? Welcome everyone to episode 53 of the Automotive History series, where we're going to take a closer look at the immediate post-war small car programs that could have potentially reshaped the American car market for decades to come, but were killed off prematurely. With the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, the United States became actively involved in the Second World War. The industry was turned upside down to make it ready for war production. Along with restrictions on fuel, tires and spare parts for the consumers, the car manufacturers had to switch from making cars to making engines and parts for army tanks, planes and vehicles. The last regular passenger car rolled off the assembly line in 1942. And for a full three years until the end of the war, no new passenger cars were produced or sold. American buyers had to accept that this was the new reality, as they were used to buying a new car every couple years, and most cars were considered past the prime if they were older than five years or so. Now the American buyer had to stick to what they had, and also had to save on fuel and spare parts. But by the end of the war, it became pretty clear that this temporary production pause led to a pent-up demand. To celebrate the end of the war and get rid of the used and abused cars, consumers were more than ready to spend money on a new car, preferably one with the latest and greatest technology invented during the war years. It was effectively open season on the car market, and new cars would practically sell themselves. And so, besides the big boys, some new car companies started to pop up in an effort to get a piece of the action. Some tried by offering regular passenger cars with only a slightly updated design, like Kaiser Fraser. Then there were some that tried offering something entirely new, radical and futuristic, like the Tucker Corporation. And then there were some that tried to get into the opposite direction, by offering a smaller and more fuel-efficient car, instead of going the conventional route of resuming production of the largest size passenger cars. Think of Henry J. And this last category is what I want to talk about. As early as the mid-war years, think 1943 or 1944, the established car makers looked ahead and wondered what the future might bring. They were aware of the possibly huge pent-up demand. Auto executives feel the pressure of current demand. But unsure what would happen in the coming years. Because maybe the war would continue for another 10 years, and the cars currently on the road would have completely fallen apart by then. All resources were used for making war material, to keep the troops overseas on the move. But eventually some small-scale car production needed to happen in order to keep the homeland on the move. And even if the war would stop in the near future, it wasn't exactly clear how the economy would rebound. Maybe it would take another 5 to 10 years before resource availability, fuel and production was back on pre-war levels. Not to mention the wages and disposable income. And so various individuals and established car companies came up with the idea of a simple and compact car. Call it a um, crisis coupe. A simple, straightforward, fuel-efficient and easy-to-service compact car that would bridge the gap between low resources now and a fully functioning economy later. That was easy on production and required materials. A car that would meet the pent-up demand without breaking the bank, but would still be a cash cow because of the high production numbers. Especially the big three, so General Motors, Ford Motor Company and the Chrysler Corporation, set up development programs for the so-called light cars. Cars that were sitting a step below the regular passenger cars, because what was considered regular for American standards was still fairly big for the rest of the world. Whereas European cars were decidedly smaller and featured two or four cylinder engines, American cars were not overly huge but still substantial in size and usually featured six or eight cylinder engines. Let's start with General Motors. In 1945, GM commenced a light car program for the Chevrolet division. GM was firm on the specs. The car's retail price would be under $1,000, or about $70,000 today, and the car had to be compact in size, weigh around 2,000 pounds, but still seat four people comfortably. 
the engineers and designers went to work under the watchful eye of chief development Earl McPherson, and the last name might ring a bell. The project was a clean slate project, and the engineers first made sure to subscribe to Ed Sauter Reviews and watch some of his videos before they tried several drivetrain setups in an effort to maximize interior space. Like the unusual rear-engine, rear-wheel drive layout, only applied to a few cars before. Eventually they settled for the good old engine in the front, the power to the rear, the most cost-effective option, although they did manage to place the three-speed manual under the driver's seat. Power came from a fairly humble 2.1 liter or 133 cubic inch six cylinder, making 65 horsepower. Might not seem like much, but fairly respectable back then, especially for a compact car. Heck, you can still find city cars today with these performance numbers. The results of these efforts looked like this, and internally the car was named the Chevrolet Cadet. The design of the Cadet was very much contemporary, getting rid of the exposed front and rear fenders, adopting the envelope or so-called pontoon styling. The overall shape can be best described as the bathtub shape that experienced a brief popularity in the late 1940s. Think of the Packards and the Mercury's of the time. Despite trying to keep the car simple, it was loaded with quite up-to-date or even advanced features. The tires were small and placed in the outer corners, maximizing interior space but also drivability, and this was a trick later pulled off during the creation of the now famous Mini. It was unibody construction and had independent suspension all around. Very unusual at the time. But this type of suspension was unique in the way that it was independent, compact, easy to make, and affordable. The suspension was designed by the chief engineer Earl McPherson, and the suspension is now known as the McPherson Struts, almost a default choice for suspension for many cars that are made today. The Ford Motor Company also went to work to create a light car for the post-war period, in 1944. Much of the development of the car is unclear, but it was going to be a car that would be a step below the outgoing 1942 Ford. Eventually, management changed their minds about the light car, and the design that was already made for the post-war and supposedly smaller Fords were bumped up to the Mercury and Lincoln divisions. The styling would be applied to the larger dimensions of these cars, and the original late 40s Fords, now with no design, would be redesigned, resulting in the now famous 1949 Ford models, lovingly nicknamed the Shoebox Fords. And I also tried to do my best to find any info on light car programs of the Chrysler Corporation, but I couldn't find any. Chrysler used to work on some other light car program as far back as the 1930s, but were eventually scrapped, especially when the war broke out. So, it were only General Motors and Ford that actively worked on the light car project, like I just talked about. And as you may notice, I keep quiet about what happened to these projects, and most of you will say that you've never heard about a Chevrolet Cadet. Were they ever produced? What happened to these projects? Well, most of the projects were cancelled right after the war, because of various reasons. And the most important reason is that, as it turned out, the Second World War ended sooner than later. And it only took the American economy about a year or two to almost fully recover. By the late 1940s, many car makers had updated their designs and the production was back on pre-war levels, and the cars sold like hotcakes. And so were these efforts of making a small car just simply thrown away? Yes and no. In late 1947, upper management at General Motors decided to scrap the Chevy Cadet program, which was interesting to say the least as they allocated factory space to set up production lines, but alas. There were loads of reasons why the Cadet program was scrapped. First of all, there were concerns that with its many advanced features, the car could still sell for a thousand bucks and not go over it. Second, upper management asked Chevy's sales team that if they'd continue with the Cadet, would it be able to sell more than 300,000 units per year? And the answer was no. Then there was the CEO of General Motors, Alfred P. Sloan, that personally wasn't convinced that the compact car wouldn't work, as he expected the American car buyers to resume buying larger models after the war was over, and in some way he was right. Then there were some internal concerns about the cadet's driving characteristics. Because the car was lighter, smaller and nimble, early test drives found that the car drove surprisingly well. Even better than a regular Chevrolet and, oh, God forbid, Cadillac. 
A car such as the Cadet would disrupt GM's price ladder, but it would offer better driving dynamics for a third of the price of the prestige luxury brand. And that wasn't gonna happen. And the last and rumored reason is that the profit margins were low on a compact car. The number-crunching finance department figured that the Cadet wouldn't meet the then customary 30% annual return rate. The cadet program was killed because it wouldn't generate enough profit, or so the rumor goes. And the last thing I want to add is that the cadet was getting dangerously close in the price range of the so-called stripper cars. Those who wanted affordable transportation should buy a basic full-size model that was stripped of all of its features, like the Chevy Stylemaster, and not a quite advanced compact car like the cadet. The cadet program was scrapped and GM didn't bother making compact cars for the years to come. And yet there are some rumors that some aspects of the cadet found their way to Australia. When the car was turned into the Holden 48 215, the car that essentially put Australia on wheels. But this story is a bit vague and some sources say that the development of the cadet and the development of the Holden were two simultaneous but separate projects, where a bit of crossbreeding might have happened. Next up is Ford. As I explained, Ford also scrapped its light car project. But the fun thing is, the engineer that worked on the Chevy Cadet switched to Ford after the program was scrapped. And his revolutionary suspension, the McPherson Strut, found a new home. Because whereas GM scrapped the light car project altogether, Ford decided to not continue it for the American market, but ship all its time and effort to Europe. What was going to be a small Ford in the US with a Mercury-like design turned into the Ford Vedette for the European market, made by the French subsidiary. The Vedette is, in fact, the result of Ford's light car project come to life. It looks like a full-size Mercury that has shrunk in the wash. Styling-wise, the Vedette was ahead of the French competition. But that was simply because of an unfair advantage. The engine was also unique. A very small displacement 2.2-liter Aquillon side valve V8, derived from the flathead V8s from America. Now, it's easy to jump on the hype train of criticizing GM and Ford for killing what could potentially be great cars in the holy name of profit margins and year-to-year -year growth. But I guess it's not so easy to say this. I think that the American consumer at the time, so the late 40s, wasn't interested in compact cars to begin with. The light car project started mostly out of necessity to provide some form of mobility during the war years or the immediate time thereafter as some sort of stopgap. But by the 1950s it was pretty clear the full-size car was the way to go. But then there were some other independent car companies that found it increasingly hard to sell full-size models and launched junior models, specifically for the demographics the big three didn't care about to make cars for. So the focus shifted from a small car that was needed to a small car that was wanted by some people that were otherwise ignored. Car companies like Kaiser Fraser, Nash and Hudson stepped into this market in a desperate effort to increase sales. Nash was the first in 1950 with the Rambler model, slightly smaller and more basic in its features. Kaiser Fraser would launch the Henry J model, also in 1950. Willys, having experience in making small and simple military off-roaders, tried it with the Arrow in 1952. And one of the last efforts to create American compact cars was Hudson with the Jet in 1953. All these compact cars I just mentioned never really caught on. They lived much in obscurity in the USA where the full-size car was king. And so, offering a light car like the Vedette or the Cadet wouldn't make sense as it wouldn't make a difference. The proof is the cars I just showed you. But what failed in the US turned into some success in the rest of the world. Because over there, it's the best of both worlds. European fuel efficiency and size. It's number one for economy. With American comfort and style. Most of these cars, despite being low cost in the US, were seen as a big upgrade over standard European car. The Henry J, for instance, experienced a brief popularity in my country, the Netherlands. And Willys Aero became a legendary model in South America. In Brazil, the car received styling updates and lasted well until 1971. It's an interesting thought what the American car scene in the 50s would look like if the compact cars would rule the road instead of the gas-guzzling tail-finned land yachts. And with a bit of an imagination, I think American cars would look much like the high-styled European cars of those years. Like the Simca Vedettes, 
or the Vauxhall Victor, or the Ford Gonzo Classic, somewhat of a miniature version of larger American models. But the big three of America would not think about making compact cars until there was a solid reason for it. This reason came in 1958 in the form of a recession, spawning some slightly smaller cars, some more successful than others. But as soon as the dust had settled, these compact cars grew over time back into mid-size or even full-size models, effectively resetting the clock until the oil crisis in 1973. Most attempts of making a compact car to battle the high gas prices were mediocre at best, to say the least. And so let's end with that the relationship between America and compact cars remain an interesting one. Yes, there are some great small cars made by American car makers, but the question is if these are an all-American effort, or a joint venture with another company with more experience in making small cars. What remains true, however, is that the Americans like their cars big, and will continue to do so until the next crisis hits, whatever it may be.